Hello, I'm Dr. Stephen Messer, Chair of Homeopathic Medicine and Pharmacology at the Southwest College of Naturopathic Medicine and Health Sciences in Tempe, Arizona. On June 2nd, 2017, I had the great pleasure and honor to host a scientific presentation by Dr. Iris Bell entitled, Understanding the Biological Basis of Homeopathic Medicine Response. Dr. Bell is one of the most important and prolific researchers in the world working to understand the basic science underlying homeopathy. A full list of her publications can be found on her website at irisbell.com. Homeopathy is a 200-year-old system of using highly dilute medicines in a paradoxical and counterintuitive way to stimulate healing in ill people. This use of extremely dilute and thereby seemingly inert medicines as well as the counterintuitive approach of giving an ill person a drug whose primary action mimics their already present disease state, has caused much of the scientific community to reject homeopathy out of hand. However, a large body of scientific research exists that support the clinical benefits of homeopathy. There are now well over a thousand published clinical trials of homeopathy, the majority of which are positive. These cover a wide range of clinical conditions from cancer patients at the Medical University of Vienna greatly outliving their expected survival when homeopathy was added to their conventional cancer care, to severely septic Israeli ICU patients significantly cutting their mortality rate when compared to controls when homeopathy was added to their treatment regimen, to the significantly superior results in patients consulting homeopathic clinics compared to those utilizing conventional drug therapy in a multi-site international outcome study of the most common routine conditions seen often in primary care practices. And yet, in spite of all the clinical research supporting the benefits of homeopathic medicine, serious questions still haunt homeopathy in the public perception. These are, one, how could medicines that are so dilute that there is seemingly nothing left in them possibly have any effect at all? And two, how does giving a medicine which produces the same symptoms a patient already has help them to heal? What might the mechanism of action of this be? These are the very questions that Dr. Bell explores and elucidates in this wonderful presentation. I encourage you to sit back and enjoy this remarkable exploration of the world of cutting-edge scientific investigation into the basic principles of homeopathy. Okay, well, thanks again, Stephen, for inviting me, and uh, hopefully this will be a very uh, fruitful discussion. Uh, we wish there were definitive answers on homeopathy, but uh, we know that right now we just have a lot of promising clues as to what we're dealing with. So, <clears throat> whoops, let me try and get my slides to move, okay. Uh, is everybody seeing the overview slide right now? Is that? Yes. Okay, good. Um, so basically what I'm going to do is try to help you structure your thinking about what goes on with the questions we should be addressing that people have been addressing in homeopathy and give you um, an update on the state of the science, particularly in more basic science of remedies and then how it might um, inform us in our biological research, of which there is a substantial amount, but not really quite enough to, to pin down everything. And then, so what we're basically going to be doing is trying to follow the thread of data from the structure of the remedy to the signal from the remedy to the response of the complex adaptive organism as a system. So tall order, but that's what we're going to go through. And you know, please feel free to ask questions. And if something is really urgent, um, let Stephen know, and he can break in and let me uh, explain something or fix something if I can. <clears throat> so the first point is to sort of organize this graphically to give you the idea. We know we start with remedies. We know somehow they managed to tell the body to heal. And the, que the questions, the core questions, are always how does that happen? Because it's such a dramatic response from such a small signal. And we'll come back to that issue over and over again. 
what you see listed under each of these four um, green kinds of circles or ellipses is the kinds of topics that have begun to be looked at as playing a role in this story. So for the remedy, turns out we're finding nanoparticle or nanostructures at a whole different scale than we typically focus on in conventional herbal medicine or drug um, conventional drugs. But we also know there's a literature on electromagnetic signals, optical signals, and even some hints that remedies may activate a kind of quantum mechanical phenomenon known as entanglement. Um, and how that could all be going on with the same remedy has been a mystery. Uh, I'll try and give you the sense that I think it all does go back to the way we make remedies, but um, that that's still yet to be completely resolved. Then the signal properties that come from that remedy, whatever they are, there's an interaction there with the, the living system, and there are certain adaptive phenomena that have been seen in living systems, all of which rely <clears throat> excuse me, on the body being a complex adaptive system. Um, I, I then parsed out the notion that there may be uh, obviously interfaces that are picking up this signal and amplifying, leading to the amplification. <clears throat> so one of them is likely to be the olfactory system uh, as a sensory system. It's one of the ways Hahnemann originally described um, methods for administering remedies. There's also the immune system, and then both of these can be tied in with uh, areas that have been studied more recently, like cell danger or damage response uh, patterns, responses to these signals, and then just biological cell signaling. Then you get all the way to the organism and you realize, well, if you follow Herring's law of cure, you have to understand that the body is self-organizing as a complex adaptive system, and that somehow when that signal gets to the body, it's the right signal, and it's amplified by the organism, then it stimulates a lot of reorganization in the way the body's functioning. So, <clears throat> to back out from that broad picture that uh, is what we're going to cover during this whole talk, I wanted to emphasize a, a more simplistic way of thinking about what a homeopathic remedy is as opposed to a conventional pharmaceutical drug. Conventional drugs tend to be seen more as ligands for local receptors in the body. Yes, they stress the body but there's not very much attention paid to that aspect of their effects unless, for example, they're an addictive drug, and then you end up inducing uh, an adaptation with addictive phenomena, and uh, you end up having withdrawal phenomena when you stop it. But with homeopathy, I think, and this is, this is going to seem puzzling to you over and over as you start hearing me talk about the nanoparticles, but I think the emphasis is really much more on the remedy as a stressor or a signal than it is as any type of actual molecular ligand that is speaking just to local receptors. I think it's instructing the body to make changes. <clears throat> so before we launch into some of the details of this, let's just quickly review the idea of how, how do people make homeopathic remedies. If something uh, is insoluble, like a metal source remedy, for example, uh, and actually many conventional drugs have this situation too, they are frequently ground up uh, in some kind of benign medium. In homeopathy, that's typically dry lactose, and that's called trituration. If you have uh, an herbal source or some kind of botanical source material or frequently an animal source material. You frequently start off actually with a tincture um, that's in ethanol and that material 
uh, that you get either from this grinding process or from the tincture is serially diluted, typically in an ethanol water solution, sometimes just in plain distilled water. But in any event, that's what's done. And in various ratios of 1 to 10, 1 to 100, uh, even 1 to 50,000, um, and so on. But each dilution step is then followed by turbulence in the solution. Uh, and that we call in homeopathy succussion, where you're agitating the contents of the vial. Classically, we make these remedies in glass. Some companies do make them in plastic, and that raises some questions about are some manufacturers making things that do or don't resemble whatever Hahnemann said he discovered originally. That's an important thing to think about. <clears throat> so if you're mechanically banging this stuff up, either with grinding or with turbulence and liquid, what could be going on here? Well, there's now quite a substantial literature in the world of what's called nanoscience that basically says you're breaking this stuff up into smaller and smaller forms. The initial level or scale that you make it into is probably considered micro scale uh, on a, a mi micrometer or micrometer uh, level. And if you keep on doing this, you'll end up at a nano scale. Uh, which is um, even smaller forms of the original material. What's fascinating about this is that when you get down to the nanoscale, these tiny forms actually acquire properties that are a function of their tiny size. They are not necessarily a function of their directly of their source material um, and not of the quantity necessarily, although that can be relevant. And we'll talk about that much more in a, in a little while. So let's take a look at what, what are we talking about with nanoscale. Well, that's actually 10 to the minus ninth of a meter. And what you see over here with the red blood cell of a, a rat, actually, is this is obviously not, um, not actual reality because this is a magnified blood cell. But if you look at where it says 100 nanometers, that's the high end of size, proportionately speaking, of what a nanoparticle is. And you can see how tiny it is relative to the size of an actual cell. Whereas when you get up to a micron or a 1,000 nanometers, um, it's still very small relative to the cell, but it's much larger than a nanometer scale. If you look over at the left side, you see some interesting points. For example, Viruses range in size from 10 to 150 nanometers. Um, if you get really small, DNA helices are actually around 2 nanometers. Uh, an atom is actually around a tenth of a nanometer in size. So it's a, a tiny, tiny scale that we're talking about um, that you really can at best see with electron microscopy. So one of the breakthrough findings uh, and, and a lot of follow-up work has come out of uh, India and one particular research group at the Indian Institute of Technology. They originally published this paper uh, on the left here on actually six different metal source remedies. And they used electron microscopy and they demonstrated that they um, could find even in potencies at 30 C or 200 C which, as you may recall, are theoretically diluted past Avogadro's number for the original bulk material, but not apparently uh, for the nanoparticle source material, um, that at those potencies they could still find nanoparticles present. There was a subsequent study looking at three different plant remedies uh, at up to a 15C potency. And again, they found nanoparticle forms. Uh, this scale thing is, is at 100 nanometers. So you see things that are very, very tiny present in there. Of course, you start asking the question, well, have they directly confirmed that this is a source material as opposed to a bunch of contaminants 
uh, that have come in through the diluent or the glassware or just bad luck of, or the preparation of the material. And that would be an argument of many skeptics, but that's not actually what the data support at this point. Other people have followed. Uh, one study, the one you see on the left here, was published several years ago on copper as a copper metal as a source. And they found extraordinarily tiny sized nanoparticles. They actually were so small, they're actually in the range of what would be called quantum dots because they're smaller than 10 nanometers. Um, now, not all of them are, but many of them are. <clears throat> Excuse me. On the right side, you see um, the people who have studied iron metallicum or ferrometallicum. And they've also found very tiny, less than five nanometer sized uh, quantum dot nanoparticles in their samples. These people have also done other very sophisticated um, measurement techniques where they can confirm the presence of the source material in these samples where they're finding the nanoparticles. So they're, they're going beyond just showing you pictures of things um, hanging out in these drops and um, actually demonstrating that it is the source material itself. And you'll see some data here in a minute. Here's a more recent uh, replication study by, another, by one of the groups that's done a great deal of work um, looking at gold as a source uh, of the uh, remedy at different potencies, all the way up to extraordinarily high potencies, and across C potencies, um, 1M and 10M and 50M and even CM potency. So we're talking about, in theory, profoundly diluted materials. What, we, what you see when you look are not always regularly shaped, but they, <clears throat> they are nanoparticles of the source material. And there's quite a bit of variability in the size of these particles. Uh, now, you would ask, well, if you keep on banging this stuff around with succussions, why would you have larger nanoparticles when you have the maximum potency here? And <clears throat> that may be partly a function. It hasn't been fully demonstrated. But partly that sometimes these materials <clears throat> attract onto their surface other nanoparticles. And they also attract anything else that might be in solution with them. And what was not specified in this study um, that we looked at in more detail was, for example, um, did they use glassware? Did they uh, use a cork stopper as opposed to um, a silicone stopper? Uh, so there could be extra materials. It could be adding contaminants. But again, we're talking about people who have demonstrated that they can find actual gold in these very high potencies. Uh, now, this is one of several studies, a fairly recent one on the gold, where this group not only showed the electron microscopy, but also showed uh, the uh, profound uh, the presence of the element gold in all of these potencies. Now, you can see that they find a lot of other things, some of which may come from the diluent, the alcohol, water, or whatever they made it in. Some of it may come uh, from other sources, like uh, small amounts of contaminants that are there. Um, hard to say. Uh, so the glassware could contribute, uh, but other things could too. <clears throat> now, this group has also gone on to look at a plant remedy. And they're one of several groups that have demonstrated that plant remedies, while they have very irregularly shaped nanoparticles, have quite a few of them. And they do attach to each other. So you get a, a, a fair amount of particle size variation, uh, which in this particular study ranged from about 72 nanometers up to 233 nanometers. So we're, we're still talking about very small materials, but very irregular agglomerated materials, um, a lot of questions about you know, how, how pure do we need a remedy to be? And I don't think we have an answer to that right now. Again, they did do an analysis as best they could of the elements that they found in these different samples they tested. 
Uh, and interestingly here, you see a lot of carbon, oxygen, and uh, silica, silicon, um, the elements, which it, are not surprising because this is a plant source material, hypericum, uh, which is St. John's wort. So, <clears throat> excuse me, we know that we have all of these materials present. Um, you can also see a fairly large amount of variability in the, in the hypericum nanoparticle sizes that are being documented. <clears throat> now, um, my own research group went ahead and we looked at um, homeopathic remedies from uh, the manufacturer Hahnemann Laboratories here in the United States, where we had them make us succussed controls and unsuccussed controls, as well as the source material remedy. And we used a technology called nanoparticle tracking analysis, which is a little bit different than electron microscopy. It has strengths and weaknesses compared with that. But what we happened to find was a remarkable similarity in the size of the nanoparticles that was documented across 6C, 30C, and 200C of a silver-derived argentum metallicum remedy. And you can see that there were um, some nanoparticles in the succussed controls at potency. And there were some, but not as many, in the unsuccussed ethanol control that simply had the same diluent, um, but it hadn't been succussed. Now, it hadn't been succussed formally by the manufacturer, but these materials were shipped from California, where they're based, uh, to I believe it was Northwestern University uh, in the Midwest. So there was obviously some unintentional and uncontrolled succussion. We made an effort to put every sample in the same box uh, when we did this kind of thing so that if, the, if um, the carrier, whether it was FedEx or UPS, really jostled the material, that everything would be jostled at the same time. So for whatever that, and this was all liquid samples, so you know, be aware that this is not representative necessarily of what would happen with pellets, but <clears throat> with the actual liquid. Well, there's more to the particles than just the fact they're very small. It turns out that their surface properties are really critical as to whether they attract other things onto their surface, whether they're stable, unstable, they fall apart, they don't fall apart as time goes on while they're sitting there in solution. And one of the ways you can start trying to quantify that property is by measuring something called zeta potential. Now, it, it basically is a, is a crude indication of the stability of the surface charge of the particle. It's measured in millivolts. And it turns out that if, in absolute value, it is either greater than plus 30 millivolts or smaller than minus 30 millivolts, it's going to be a more stable particle. And what you see here was most of the things that were deliberately succussed were awfully close to that minus 30 cutoff. The one that was the least stable was the unsuccussed ethanol control. And the most stable, interestingly, for whatever reason, was the Argenta Metallicum 6C. Uh, so interesting observation. Again, this was exploratory. Some people have followed up with work of this type. Many people have not. And I think that's very unfortunate because the size of the particles is, is informative. But you want to begin to see something about the properties and what you're dealing with on these particles. We then followed up with another study looking at gelsemium potencies, uh, again, C potency, 630 and 200C with succussed controls. And we included the same unsuccussed control. But again, Hahnemann Laboratories has made a point during their manufacturing history of using the methods that Samuel Hahnemann um, reported 
and or would have had available to him at the time he did this work originally 200 years ago. Well, what did he have for stoppers? Well, he probably had glass stoppers maybe available. He also had cork, natural cork, which is basically from oak tree bark. And um, I began to suspect that maybe the reason I was having these awfully large, um, larger particles and more of them was because I was actually putting plant-based material, botanical material from the cork into the solution when it was jostled or deliberately succussed. If that was the case, then I was guessing that I would see fewer nanoparticles and different nanoparticle properties if I used silicone stoppers. So as just an extra group, we did several vials that were unsuccussed control solution, just the diluent, but they were stoppered with silicone uh, stoppers, not natural cork stoppers. And you can see that there was a difference in uh, what uh, the concentration of nanoparticles you see at different sizes. And this is just average sizes anyway. Well, then we again did the zeta potential, and it was even more informative. Again, what you see is that anything that was actually officially succussed uh, had a more stable zeta potential. But when you look at the silicone unsuccussed controls, yeah, there were nanoparticles there, but they were uh, they their zeta potential was very close to zero, and they were very unstable. So they were not. Um, th this is not just a phenomenon of contaminants. This is a phenomenon of the manufacturing method that Hahnemann originally developed, because he sure didn't have silicone stoppers or other kinds of rubber stoppers to work with in his day. So this is very interesting, um, something, again, that needs to be further evaluated in terms of, well, what kind of remedies do we end up with if a manufacturer uses more modern materials uh, and methods in making their remedies. Well, in the background, at almost the same time as the nanoparticle finding was published, there was a great deal of interest generated around the notion that remedies are classically made in glassware. And glassware is typically made from uh, some kind of uh, uh, well, some kind of basically silicon-based material. Uh, it has other things in it, but uh, you, you're going to see a whole variety of literally pieces of the glassware appearing uh, as particles, if you will, that are knocked off into the solution by the physical force of the succussion you see a far higher level, this is just one of several studies that demonstrated this, whenever something was succussed material in glass as opposed to when it was um, made in plastic. So the silicone, uh, the silica was there, the silicon content, that's the element. And whenever silicon comes in contact with oxygen, which is pretty common, in homeopathic manufacturing. There's no oxygen-free environments that are, they're typically made in necessarily. Um, you're going to form silica because that is silicon dioxide. And when you do, the silica is potentially a factor in the remedy. The succust is going to have silica in it. So um, people were saying, well, lovely that you found that, but who cares? Because that doesn't tell us a unique signal. Well, there is some evidence, however, that if anything is succussed, there is some biological property that it may exert. This was a study a number of years ago. Saw was um, um, Dr. Bell, that, could you could you yes. repeat what you said? We lost your audio for a minute or two since this oh, new sure. slide came on. We lost her again. 
Yeah, we're we're not hearing you right now. Oh dear. Uh, oh, yeah, now you're back. <laughs> Sorry. Don't know what happened. I don't know either. Well, let's keep trying. Okay. I can try to switch over to headphone, but I I thought the phone would be. Yeah, I think. Now we just lost. Yeah, I'm hearing I'm hearing her. I'm hearing her quite clearly on on my phone line, just for uh, the purposes uh -huh. of. Yeah. Hmm. So can you all hear me now? Now we hear you. Hmm. All right. Well, let me know as I talk about this. Song. Okay. Okay. Thank um, you. <clears throat> this. So what what this slide basically showed was that a, a combination remedy. It had multiple botanical sources. This. The, the one that ends in dash two, uh, had the biggest effect of closing this wound that was artificially caused in the Petri dish of the cells. Plain succus solvent had a biological effect. It did help do some healing. So that silica that's floating around in there may in fact be biologically active, and there actually is every reason to think that would be. but. When you had unsuccess solvent, you didn't see as much biological effect. So this is a, a very small indicator that succussion is doing something to generate biologically active materials in a remedy. <clears throat> well, in addition to what I just showed you about silica, people hypothesized then, well, what, what's going on here with these remedies? If, if we have nanoparticles that are fairly stable but still reactive on their surface, what happens if there's a lot of silica floating around, or sil basically silica precursors floating around in a solution that has been succussed? Well, this group followed up, the same original group from India, with uh, electron microscopy demonstrating that the silicates that were knocked off the glassware were actually forming silica coatings around the outside of the source nanoparticles, which was a very striking finding. So you may have silica all by itself as a nano form, nano, nanoscale form, and you may have these hybrid materials, which are the remedy source material surrounded by silica. Um, what it turns out is that silica is a great amplifier of electronic signals, all kinds of signals. And it actually is a biological uh, signal. It, it produces its own signal as well because it will stimulate immune system reactions uh, when given the opportunity to interact with immune cells. The um, materials can, in fact, when they are in nanoscale form, generate electromagnetic signals, optical signals, and fascinatingly, even quantum entanglement phenomena. So we're not necessarily talking about direct biochemical effects. Again, we're going back to, huh, maybe the fact that we made nanostructures is the source of why we're seeing these unusual signals in remedies. Well, what do I mean by that? Well, Nobel Prize winner Luc Montagne, uh, several years ago now, demonstrated that if he homeopathically prepared various bacteria, he could actually detect a unique electromagnetic signal in potencies made in the X series, which is the 1 to 10 dilution series. Um, he didn't find it in everything, but he demonstrated that it was there, and he was able to replicate this type of finding in various ways. Um, so he was actually able to take the signal and even transmit it to bacteria that were uh, otherwise neutral and unaware of uh, th this kind of information until uh, put in proximity to where the succussed bacteria were. Now, in addition to that type of thing, and there have been several other studies suggestive and consistent with electromagnetic signals, there's also some indication of optical signals. Many years ago now, um, Dr. Ray from, uh, I don't remember where he, where he was located, but it, um, 
he published a paper demonstrating that if something was prepared up to a 15 C potency compared with heavy water or deuterium, D2O, uh, that if he made it with sodium chloride in the solution or lithium chloride, he got unique signals of light emission when he treated the solution by freezing it and then hitting it with x-rays and then slowly warming it up. As he slowly warmed it up, there was light released that he could quantify. And this is called thermoluminescence. And you can clearly see that he found a difference there. A later group, um, more recently in Germany, has used a different technique with even higher potencies, way higher potencies, uh, and using pellets as the original source of the remedy material compared with just plain lactose um, uh, pellules or, or globules. And again, you see in their light measurement, their optical measurements, you see that the remedy appears to have properties optically that you don't see in the control solution. Now, this is all followed on a, a whole series of studies showing that there were certain kinds of conventionally used spectroscopy techniques that would demonstrate that remedies were different from each other and they were different uh, in, and, and each potency was somewhat different from the other potency. So what you see here is some data on Natra muriaticum and Nux vomica at 6C, 12C, and 30C. Uh, Pattern-wise, they are somewhat different. And uh, the potencies are definitely different from each other. They also used not only Raman spectroscopy, but something called ultraviolet visible spectroscopy, or UV vis. Uh, they, other groups have followed up with other methods where they, again, in this case, they were looking at aconite 30C potency in multiple samples compared with placebo samples. And they, too, found a difference with the measurement of the UV visible spectroscopy um, that you see um, with uh, the, the, the verum or the uh, aconite versus placebo. Um, sorry about the dog barking. There's um, a delivery that has shown up at the door, but I don't have to deal with it. So <laughs> we shall proceed. Um, the homeopathic remedies uh, have also been studied with more controversial techniques. We used another optical laser tech based technique called gas discharge visualization, again, many years ago now, where we looked at natremure, pulsatilla, and lachesis in potency um, that came off of pellet sources. And we compared them with plain uh, pellets with no remedy on them and plain solvent. And again, you see that the properties of that material um, are such that the, um, the verum had different optical properties than the controls. So what we're saying here is we've got the remedy potencies getting into a unique form. And it turns out that nanoparticles may actually be able, <laughs> and remedies certainly do, to structure water when they get into solution. So people have even done studies where they take a liquid form of the remedy and put it into just plain distilled or purified water. And it appears to cause the or induce the formation of nanostructures in that water, which is very striking. And that has other signal type properties as well. Um, additional people have further hypothesized that it could be the electromagnetic signals coming off the remedy, whatever it is, um, which are actually structuring water or otherwise signaling the body, uh, however it does that, to activate self-regulatory or modulatory adaptation um, through various biological mechanisms. OK, so 
So let's look at the larger, move on to the much larger picture. And that is that um, complex systems tend to be uh, complex. They have multiple parts, they have interrelationships, and they have interactions. So they don't just sit there like a car where if you take out one piece of it, you can take it out, replace it, and on goes the car. Um, in a human being or a living organism, there's more of an interrelationship. The body knows if the appendix was removed or the gallbladder was taken out um, or the, the liver replaced with a transplant. It knows that. Um, and what people in the complex systems research world have focused on is, is trying to really change the whole scientific paradigm of how we see the body. Because their point is the vitalism that was characteristic of Hahnemann's approach to thinking about health and homeopathy, that there was a top-down flow of information um, is, is true. But the mechanists, the, the more reductionistic modern scientists, I uh, tend to see that the flow of information goes up, you know, that we start with all the parts, we understand the parts, and we put them back together again, and lo and behold, we understand something in theory. Um, but in reality, a complex system has both top-down information flow, bottom-up information flow, and interactions along the way between the parts, and that all of that information flow actually generates sort of an emergent set of properties for the organism, the living system. So the model that, that I uh, suggested, I, I adapted it from other uh, literatures that I ran into, was that the remedy somehow is serving as, first of all, a relevant or salient signal, and as somewhat of a bio, mild biological stressor that tell, excuse me, tells the cell, hey, you better adapt here. If this, if this stressor showed up in, in larger quantity, you're doomed. You would die. But if it only sort of stresses the cell and the cell can make repairs, can make adaptations, what actually happens is greater resistance to that same stressor, but also to any other stressor that might be similar. That's called cross-resistance, if you will, in some of the literature on adaptive systems. And that's a very important concept because in homeopathy, really what we're saying is you already generated a really stressed body and set of cells. Um, what we're trying to do is speak to the net or emergent screwed up noise <laughs> that your body um, is making we want to speak to that and tell the body, hey, you better get your act together and go back the other way. Uh, and I'll show you in a, a couple minutes here how I think uh, we can adapt some other scientific research to understand that. So first of all, if such a signal were getting received, how could it get through? Well, as I mentioned at the beginning, the olfactory sensory system is capable of getting the signal straight into the brain into areas that regulate autonomic uh, nervous system and immune function. So there's a lot of potential crosstalk. There is the potential of triggering the immune system and cell-to-cell -cell signaling. And this type of phenomenon has been found with nanoparticles. So again, let me emphasize, we are not necessarily saying a pharmacologic effect. We're just saying a signaling effect. But there is evidence that that signaling effect occurs, and then it's then taken up by the immune system and other cell-to-cell -cell signaling um, mechanisms in the body, which then carry in and amplify the response to that tiny signal. So this is just a diagram uh, of a, an article that, that highlights that concept, that Exogenous danger signals can include things like viruses and bacteria, but also nanoparticles. That's been demonstrated. 
And once you get all this attempt of the body and the cells to uh, reorganize, you have a lot of cellular response going on. Um, this slide is, you don't need to follow the details of it, but it's just to give you that sense that if you start with a, um, a stem cell kind of um, beginning, you actually can end up differentiating some of these original cells into various part white cell participants in the immune system that have various functions, including monocytes, macrophages, and dendritic cells. Now, it turns out that there's even been research demonstrating uh, fairly recently that uh, depending on what's going on with the cell and the environment of that cell, you actually can stimulate with a nanoparticle either pro-inflammatory or anti-inflammatory responses, uh, really depending on a variety of conditions. So again, the emphasis here is don't think of the remedy as if it's a drug separate from the body. You have to think of it as something that interacts with the body and that the net effect depends on that interaction. So do we have any hints that that might be going on? Well, um, years ago, there was a group in Brazil that uh, used a very complex homeopathic medication uh, for treating cancer and immune and uh, AIDS patients. And they expanded it into other types of immune system uh, conditions. But what they found was in uh, both cellular and animal studies that they could modulate the uh, cytokine response of macrophages uh, and gene expression of those macrophages by giving the verum canova, which was the combination homeopathic remedy, versus controls. And so they began to refer to this material as an immunomodulatory agent. Uh, just to go back to another diagram to emphasize to you, there are various elements involved in this sort of stress response of cells when a danger signal is picked up. And <clears throat> elements that are shown on the left, in sort of their interrelationships, they can lead to being sick or to healing. You see a list here on the right of things like reactive oxygen species, heat shock protein responses, phagocytes and macrophages and T cell responses, cytokine release, and even central nervous system function, uh, including the olfactory system, but not limited to that. Those are all elements of this network, this biochemical or bodily or immune system or central nervous system immune system network that we've been talking about. These are all elements for which there is some evidence that homeopathic remedies, when administered in, in controlled conditions, uh, have modulatory effects on all of these. So this is not just a theory. It actually is supported by data. So let's assume that all of these responses are going on. How, how do they happen, and how can we get such a big response? Well, so far in my review of the literature, I've found three different uh, kinds of material, uh, of processes that are um, known to occur in complex adaptive systems. They don't tend to occur without the, adaptive, the complex adaptive system interaction. Um, and they all could play some sort of a relevant role in what goes on in the body once the remedy signal is received. The first is stochastic resonance. Another more broad term is called hormesis, which has been talked about in the homeopathy literature for a while. And a third is an area that, that my group has studied for a number of years in different contexts. And it's called time-dependent sensitization, where, yes, the external stressor, if you will, sets off the adaptive response, but it takes off on its own. And the next time the body encounters something, the response is larger than it was the first time it saw it. So let's go into these in a little more detail. In stochastic resonance, 
you see the notion that if you put a weak signal embedded into a noise that just happens to also contain the same frequency as the weak signal, the, the noise amplifies that signal. To me, that sounds like what we're talking about when we're talking about giving a similimum. Because we know it's a weak signal. We know it's a small dose of a small item. And even if it's nanoparticles, we're giving a small amount of it. But it has a unique property to it, which captures the information of the original source material. Uh, and that information is a similar match, a pattern match, to the disease biology that this individual is suffering from. Uh, so it could be that, yeah, you have to be, if somebody is sick, they will get well when you give the correct remedy because you have to have the noise going on to amplify the signal so that the body can say, oh, what's that all about? So just to give you uh, some kind of maybe simpler example of stochastic resonance that's been seen in biology and behavior, uh, if you have an animal uh, who has a predator, a, a, ma a mammalian uh, animal that's a prey animal, and a predator is anywhere remotely nearby, a tiny, tiny, part per trillion kind of quantity of the odor of that predator will activate a whole biological and behavioral response of the prey animal to escape, to do what it can. It will, it will be activated. Similarly, even in crayfish, they've studied that if the crayfish predator is anywhere nearby, the, um, uh, the vibrations in the water of that uh, predator for the crayfish will actually trigger the crayfish to run away as fast as it can. This is a stochastic resonance kind of phenomenon. The signal is weak but the amplification is going on in the organism because the signal be, um, turns out to mean something to that individual. Now, in hormesis, um, we get into what would be sort of formally called a nonlinear biphasic dose-response relationship. It has been demonstrated as a phenomenon with literally physical stress, psychological stress, actual drugs or just toxic chemicals from the environment. And it tends to occur uh, when you give a low dose, typically below what's considered in the world of toxicology, the, whoops, sorry, the no observed adverse effect level or the no well level. Below that cutoff is where you begin to see hormesis. Um, you don't see it when the material is at a toxic level. Um, you're going to see more of an inhibitory effect, for example, of a toxic chemical or a drug. But if you were to give a tiny amount of it um, that was below the toxic level, you would actually stimulate this hormetic response of the organism as the dose goes down. Now, what do, what do we um, know about homeopathically prepared materials? Well, there were some very early studies in the 1990s and even earlier by um, groups that looked at the question of whether hormesis in um, already injured cells could trigger some kind of recovery experience. And if it did, could you find a parallel of this recovery? Well, so I believe they poisoned the cells with either arsenic or cadmium or heat shock itself. And what they found was that there were certain heat shock proteins, which are a protective protein within a cell that help it deal with and recover from damage caused by heat or other kind or chemical uh, exposures to poisons like this. And there was a greater survival. The more similar the material was to the nature of the damage that the cell had encountered. So they actually did this model years ago and gave up because very few people in homeopathy knew what to do with this at the time. 
I think it's very fundamental research that should be followed up on. Now, this hormesis concept gets even more squirrely and complicated. There was a study in bacterial metabolism that this graph illustrates for you, where they prepared formaldehyde in C potencies up to about a 20 C. So formaldehyde is obviously a toxin for bacterial cells. And what they saw was actually a sinusoidal dose response curve, clearly nonlinear. Um, but some potencies, if you will, these dilution uh, elements, actually reduce the metabolism of the cell. But other potencies produced an increase in the metabolism. If you kept going, you went back down again. And if you kept going even further with potent potentization, you ended up with a reversal in direction again, and then another drop off. So you see this sort of sinusoidal um, manifestation of hormesis, where there could be more than just one simple curve, where, OK, you get too much, you're toxic, you get uh, less of it, and you're healing. Um, now, a third kind of phenomenon that I've looked at uh, is called time-dependent sensitization. And we used it in human subjects, we studied it in human subjects, who were given individually relevant or salient homeopathic remedies while we were measuring their brain waves. The remedy was administered in the laboratory by sniffing the bottles, and we controlled for just sniffing the diluent or control solution. And we, in this particular study, we studied fibromyalgia patients who showed a clinical response to their individualized remedy compared with placebo. But we also found, for example, that the brainwave response from baseline, the very first time they encountered their remedy, again, controlled for just the act of sniffing, uh, and the three-month follow-up period after they had taken the remedy. In this case, at home, they were taking LM potencies. And we took whatever potency they were being treated with when they started treatment and when they were at the three-month point and uh, had them sniff that versus controls. So you can see the placebo group just showed a decrease in the brainwave response over time. But the Verum group, the ones that got the actual individualized remedy actually showed an increase in the brainwave response over time. That is, they got a lower dose and their brainwave response got larger. We followed this up with another study where we recruited people, screened them for being more remedy-like of sulfur, homeopathic sulfur or homeopathic pulsatilla types. And then we administered the remedy or placebo to those people in different potencies over a three-week period where they came to the laboratory once a week for three weeks. And then what you see in this graph is the average of the eight presentations that were randomized and blinded when people were asked to sniff the material um, during the course of these three sessions. And so just to add even more complexity and confusion, we, in this analysis, divided people into people who said by a standardized validated questionnaire that they were high in chemical, environmental chemical intolerance or low in environmental chemical intolerance. And what you see, for example, in the sulfur group is that the sulfur group was much more variable. Every time they ran into the, um, the actual remedy, they were either going down or they were going up, but they weren't doing a fairly flat response that the people who were low in chemical intolerance were doing. Now, let me remind you that many people in the world of homeopathy have talked about these chemically intolerant patients as what they called universal provers, people who would show a response to almost any remedy you tested them with, no matter how close or not close it was to their actual clinically indicated remedy. Um, with pulsatilla, it was a different pattern, but was also 
quite divergent in that the high chemical intolerance people went way down, uh, whereas the people who were low in chemical intolerance ended up over the course of the sessions up in the response of their brainwaves uh, in alpha brainwave activity to what they were sniffing. So let's sort of back up again to the notion of, well, do we know anything about mechanisms of these things? Well, you could possibly construe time-dependent sensitization as a type of hormesis. And if you do, then there is a literature on the types of mechanisms biologically that hormesis can trigger. Um, first of all, we know nanoparticles can trigger hormesis. It's been repeatedly demonstrated. Uh, and those are just review articles on it. There are a couple of other papers I've also found that, are, that uh, have come out after this last review, again, demonstrating that, yes, nanoparticles in low dose trigger hormesis. Now, there are different mechanistic types that have been documented. One is somewhat more receptor-based. And you can see that there are variations of what the receptor might do to um, certain kinds of uh, quantities of the material. And there may be different receptors that are stimulatory or inhibitory to the responses. So you get, a, again, a very, the potential for a very complex response, but there are mechanisms that have been identified with various materials. There's also cell-to-cell -cell signaling, which um, was demonstrated to some extent in a homeopathy study using one remedy in animals that uh, had developed a, an experimentally induced cancer and were given a remedy that actually helped resolve the cancer, but also produced measurable changes in the cell signaling pathways associated with the death of cancer cells. So if we, if we again, step even further back now and say, well, with homeopathy, with the biological research, where do we have literature in the field? Uh, that gives us some hints as to what we might want to be studying. And, well, the, the better literature is in infection, in allergy to some extent, in inflammation and <clears throat> injury, and also, curiously, um, a very growing literature in cancer. There's an increasing number of papers, particularly coming out of India, showing that various homeopathically prepared remedies have anti-cancer effects in different kinds of conditions. Now, a starting place, and that's all I'm going to call it right now, because there are all these other mechanisms that I've hinted at as we've been talking. Um, macrophages look like a good place to start based on where the literature originally pointed us. That points us to looking at the gene expression patterns of these macrophages and the, the biological response mediators that the gene expression patterns lead to. And that would be things like cytokine changes and heat shock protein responses and so on. Just to confuse matters, I just wanted to give you um, <clears throat> an overview diagram of the signaling pathways that people have identified uh, in cells. Now, I, I doubt this is a perfect cell, and it's not every cell. Um, and some of them are related to cancer cells more than to, convention, to um, healthy cells. But you will find in the literature, even on homeopathy now, you will see points made in some of the papers that you'll see in your bibliography and that you'll run into if you just do a, a, a PubMed search, that a lot of these kinds of pathways ha show some indication of activation when a rem homeopathic remedy capable of inducing the death of cancer cells uh, is administered to those cells in a controlled situation. And many times, the control material doesn't have this effect, and many times, the homeopathic remedy, strangely enough, will stimulate the death of the cancer cell, but not the death 
of the normal cell. So here's, uh, this is not a study of homeopathy. This is a study of very low doses of gold nanoparticles uh, showing, again, a, a, a relatively focused study on skin cell gene expression. And they did both non-chronic or more acute exposure to this one-tenth of a nanomolar quantity of these gold nanoparticles uh, versus chronic, which you know was, was obviously a longer-term exposure. And you can see that there were different patterns if they gave an acute as opposed to a chronic exposure to these same nanoparticles uh, in low dose. And you can see that there was quite a persistent and very striking response, again, across many of the kinds of mediators or factors that we talked about and more just by giving the acute dose. So this is, again, a hint that we're in the right ballpark. We just need to start doing studies of this type. Um, this is a, a study just to illustrate to you just using the a very well-known remedy, Calcarea carbonica, in potency, that it can actually induce some of these pathways involved in modulating immune system responses and leading to the death of the uh, cancer cell. And a uh, very striking kind of ability to cause regression of the tumors that uh, have been experimentally um, given to these uh, experimental animals. So what about in human cells? Well, they, they haven't done very many studies, but this is a recent study using Arnica, where they looked at the modulation of gene expression in a specific human leukemia monocytic cell line. And again, what you see at different potencies, we're, we're pooling the samples here, but at 5C, 9C, and 15C, you see certain um, gene expression factors are actually increased and some are decreased. Um, and this is compared uh, often with the control material. So you begin to see some hint, again, that what we're talking about is not just theory. Now, there are several studies now showing gene modulation effects of homeopathic remedies in various preparations. So this is not, far from the only one. So let's just revisit this whole notion that we're dealing with living systems that are complex. The individual parts interact. They interconnect. They do all kinds of things. And that complexity arises as an emergent property of the overall system that the individual parts just don't have. The dynamics of all of this are nonlinear, which means small changes can cause large effects in the system if you hit the system with just the right timing, with just the right signal. It is very sensitive to initial conditions. It's related to what has been called chaos theory many years ago. But complexity is a little bit more directly relevant to living systems per se. And what you see is living systems are self-organizing that have an emergent order, but no single point of control. Uh, clearly, the brain's a very important hub for the way the body works. But it's not the only um, important uh, point of control in the system. It does interact with all the other parts of the body as it's talking to them. Now, to summarize for you, do we have some data to suggest that this complex system concept means something in homeopathy? Well, we've now got data with, at least with the remedy Apis, Gelsemium, Arnica, and Arsenicum Malbum, different model systems showing that these remedies do modulate gene expression. We also have some um, very fascinating data uh, from Stephen Baumgartner's research group uh, in Europe and Scandinavia, where they studied biocrystallization patterns, very complex patterns that a remedy could induce in plants, um, in plant materials in solution, um, 
and that those patterns would differ substantially from the controls. Then we have this issue of the signaling networks we talked about and local healing mechanisms. Now, in actual living people, do we have any kind of suggestion that, that these nonlinear dynamical effects might occur? Well, we do in a study that our group did on young adults who were sleeping in the laboratory. We took a look at their slow wave sleep, so their non-REM sleep, and we scored it over several cycles of, you know, when you cycle through sleep, you have non-REM and REM, rapid eye movement cycles. And we, we took a, a look at a particular measure of what would be considered complexity. This measure of complexity is called multi-scale entropy. Far be it from me to be able to explain it. Our statistician knew how to do it. <laughs> and um, he calculated it using the frequency data, the raw data, from slow wave sleep of these young adults when they either received a remedy or they received nothing the next night. This is all controlled for their baseline sleep and a baseline test when they just got placebo pellets without any remedy attached. One group of the people got cafe cruda. A different group got nux vomica. Again, they were pre-screened to have constitutional types where one dose of the remedy might be expected to do something to them. They were people with a history of coffee-induced insomnia but they were not drinking coffee during the course of the um, study. What you see here is, first of all, the Café Accruta and Nux Vomica induced a change in complexity in opposite directions when the remedy was given. So the Café Accruta increased and the Nux Vomica decreased uh, the complexity of the brainwave signal in these people over the course of a sleep period of a sleeping night. The next night, we hypothesized there would be an adaptive rebound effect. And indeed, that's what we saw. So you see that the Café Accruta people showed an increased complexity the day they got the remedy, a decreased complexity the next night. In contrast, the Nux Vomica people who decreased complexity on the night they got the remedy, they showed a relative increase across all REM cycles of sleep in the complexity of their brainwave signal. Now, is this simple to understand? Can I you know, easily explain it? No. But what I can say is this is some direct indication in living, healthy human beings that if you give them a remedy relevant to their particular type as a constitution, you will modify the um, very complex adaptive response of their brain when they are not even conscious when they are in a sleep state. So just to pull this all together, and then we can do question and answer, the overview of the process is you start with the right remedy. We still have to do that. We haven't made tremendous gains in that, but we're doing better. We have many systems that help. The remedy serves as a signal to that individual organism which is having trouble with some kind of disease process that is generating its own kind of biological noise in the system. That organism is detecting the signal, amplifying that signal, and then amplifying the response across the entire network that is a living body. And that process leads to a healthier organism. So that is, you know, I went down into the weeds and we've come back up from the weeds uh, or the forest and the trees or however you want to look at it, but that's where we are. So the take home points are the remedies, there's plenty of evidence now that they contain source and silica coated nanoparticles. These seem to capture the unique signal properties of the material. And if present, silica actually can amplify the biological effects of the original material. Uh, do you have to have silica? No, 
But if you do, you probably get a stronger effect. Homeopathic healing itself is some type of nonlinear adaptive physiological response to this signal. In the vast majority of cases at higher potencies, it is not a direct drug effect. It's not a pharmacologic process. How it happens probably can involve the central nervous system, gene expression, immune function, and inflammation modulating all of um, the mediators of those. And that is likely um, part of the biological response amplification and the remedy effects. So I will conclude just saying, disclaimer-wise, I am a consultant for Standard Homeopathic uh, Highlands, Inc. And none of the company's products were discussed in this presentation, and none of the studies discussed here, to my knowledge, um, used any of their products. Uh, but I did want to give you that disclaimer. So with that, I will stop and let's do questions. OK, Dr. Bell, thank you so much for that wonderful presentation. The first question I think uh, I can answer, which is uh, somebody asked if the, the presentation will be recorded. It is recorded, and it will be. Um, uh, active, uh, available to people. So the next question, Dr. Bell, have there been any studies to investigate information transmission between nanoparticles and biophotons from the cell? The closest we've come uh, are actually some of the optical signal studies that I showed. I believe that the biophoton work will turn out to be very valuable and important. Um, I think it will be in one sense, my gas discharge visualization is the closest to something that might be considered um, capable of measuring biophotons, uh, but that's a very controversial technique. And one of the problems in this field is, yeah, the biophotons are more accepted in certain areas of research at this point, um, but they're, <laughs> they're still scoffed at in conventional medicine. And so we often run into this issue that if you're measuring a controversial intervention with a controversial measurement technique, you have trouble. And uh, so that's the best I can say right now, that the skeptics will be um, demanding much, much more stringent evidence uh, if you start looking there. And yet that may be where the right place to look is. OK, and the next question is, I guess a little bit related, and I want to tell people in the in the room here, if you have questions, if you want to write them down and bring them up, I can ask Dr. Bell. And then those of you who are online, oh, I see some are, are typed in here, so we'll get to those next. Um, but you can also do that, and I'll see them. So is there evidence so far that nanoparticle signal is transmitted by a scalar wave phenomenon? I wish I could answer that. I don't know. Good question. OK. Um, are you, is she able to see these questions? No. So what do I do to send her this one? I just read it. OK. What is the significance of the increase or decrease in brain waves in response to a remedy? Um, these are acute responses, typically. And it, clinically, it may not have, it, it's more of a correlate of the biological response we saw. Uh, in that the people who were very good responders actually showed a very unique pattern of reactivity when they sniffed the remedy. Um, but that didn't by itself mean that they were healed. Uh, however, we did do further sub-analysis in the fibromyalgia study, and we found that the people who had a spectacular clinical response um, when they first uh, sniffed the remedy. And they, they didn't feel well at that point. But over a period of time, as we followed them, those people uh, did turn out to both globally have their health improve and locally with the fibromyalgia tender point pain uh, evaluation done by blinded evaluators, um, that, those, that, that those two measures got dramatically better. Um, and we could identify the people that were going to have that by um, the response during the very first time they ever were exposed to the remedy ever 
and that was in the laboratory during the first sniff session. So that's the closest I can come to saying anything about that. Okay. Are there any other questions from the room? Um, okay, I have um, I have a okay. Well, yeah, one just showed up. Um, in regards to single versus multi dosing, which method of dosing would be more effective in symbol, signal amplification of adaptive responses? Would it depend on the disease pathology, such as acute versus chronic? Good question. Uh, we we. Um, in a, as you know, just clinically, sometimes you have to repeat acute dosing very rapidly and very frequently in order to get the response going. Um, it would be hard for me to make a prediction right now because in a chronic situation, if one dose, one exposure, at least the, the hint we have from that gold nanoparticle study on gene expression, um, if all you want to do is get the signal through because you need the body to do all of its healing things, one dose may be sufficient until um, whatever it is that happens that so-called burns out the remedy or ends the remedy response, um, that giving multiple doses may not make sense. You, you may confuse the picture. And part of the reason I'm saying that is that in the literature on time-dependent sensitization, um, the original work was done with uh, stimulant drugs like just me, cocaine or amphetamine. And what they found was they asked the question. We, we just lost you again, Dr. Bell. Oh, no. Can you hear us now, Dr. Bell? We can't hear you. Uh, you're still not there. Oh, come on back. <laughs> well, that may be the end of the seminar. Everybody oh, are you back? Yeah, I just um, gave up on my telephone for the moment. Oh, okay. I don't know what happened there, so I just switched over to the computer audio. Okay, well, we're hearing you fine now. You were talking about stimulant drugs. Yeah, stimulant drugs, when given too frequently, um, actually induced what, what, what they termed a, an oscillatory phenomenon, which, you know, uh, is very interesting because we have some evidence in homeopathy that that can happen with remedies. Uh, but they found that if they kept going, they would push the sensitization, the, the amplified response, up, 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 up. It would peak at some point, and the next dose would actually turn around the direction of the response, and it would start going the other way. So that starts, you know, it starts suggesting that what the remedy is doing is taking advantage of that, sort of piggybacking onto that, and causing that reversal in direction. Um, but it's um, by itself, it's uh, you know, it could be that if you over again, if you over frequently dose, you are just going to start shoving the system and getting it confused. You're going to get increases and decreases in the response direction, um, and you don't really want to confuse it. You want to you know let it know the signals there and let it do its thing. Okay. Um, doesn't look like there's another question. I have a question for you. It's a little bit a little bit change of topic, but you know, you have spoken so in so many contexts of um, actual debates with skeptics to uh, conventional scientific conferences and so on. Do you see any change in the um, inability of the conventional scientific world to accept this enormous body of uh, research in homeopathy? Among the skeptics, I would say no. Um, when, every time I encounter some ridiculous um, document or online web page or whatever, they're still arguing dilution. And they're not aware, they're not aware of any of the research. Um, and they're still expecting that you, that it's absurd 
you know, that look, we know that the only thing that can work is a pharmaceutical drug that hits its receptors, and if you don't have enough of it, you're not going to see anything. So let's stop arguing here. That's their position, and I haven't seen them move ahead in understanding that there could be another um, set of data out there. Mm -hmm. Okay. Any other questions here? Well, it looks like we're done. Um, I, again, I want to thank you so much for taking the time to do this for us. It's um, just it, amazing to to see the amount and breadth and depth of the of the uh, amount of research that's out there. And I have somebody like you who's done so much of it yourself um, talking to us about it. It's just been wonderful. And I'll tell you, you can't see it, but along on this question box, we're getting lots of thank yous that are coming through from the people online. They really appreciate your talk. So thank you very much, Dr. Bell. Well, great. I appreciate the chance to tell you about it. And uh, please feel free to email me if, uh, you know, for any reason you uh, see, uh, you know, some question comes up later. Okay. All right. Everybody have a nice day. Okay. Thanks. Bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>